Good, good afternoon. Welcome to our session, um, distributed and uh, enabling, sorry, <laughs> enabling coordinated checkpointing for distributed HPC applications. My name is Adrian Reber. I work at Red Hat for nine years now. I'm involved in um, Checkpoint Restore, which is the basis for all of what we're doing here today. For 14 years now, um, we're doing everything we do with Checkpoint Restore. It's based on Creu. Um, I'm involved there, I guess, now 12 years. And since I'm at Red Hat, I'm mainly focusing on um, container migration. Today here with me is Radostin. So, hello, everyone. My, my name is Radostin. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford supervised by Professor Wes Armo, and my research is focusing on enabling Checkpoint Restore for um, HPC clusters. Okay, and um, today's agenda will look something um, like this. We're, I will go through the background of, of Checkpoint Restore, a bit about the history, why the names are the way they are. Then I'll talk about integration into existing container runtimes, engines, orchestration, then I talk about use cases, why you would want to use Checkpoint Restore in combination with um, containers. Then I will do a migration demo. This is not coordinated yet, it's just a simple pod migrating from one host to another host. The distance between will be about 500 kilometers. And then um, Radostin will talk about coordinated checkpointing in an HPC environment, why it's necessary and what the challenges are there. So, background. So the tool we are using here is called Creu. It's called Checkpoint Restore in User Space. And the reason for the name, especially in User Space, is um, because it's um, a tool, and there were many different tools before. So Checkpoint Restore is a technology in operating systems and Linux for a long time. In, in the early years, 20 years ago, it was mainly done in high-performance computing, and the main use case was fault tolerance. If you have 1,000 nodes running, something stops working, you don't want to restart from the beginning. So you, you're looking into Checkpoint Restore your compute jobs uh, regularly. And at that time, there were two tools developed around 20 years ago. One was an external kernel module, which was never in tree, and which you had to compile um, separately to be able to use it, and then you had to preload libraries. So the, the solution was never what you would call a transparent checkpoint because you had to prepare your application. Either recompile it or prepare it in some other way. And to solve this problem, there was um, an approach for Checkpoint Restore which was in the kernel. It was a, a huge patch set around, I think, 2006 or 2005 or a, I don't know, some time ago. And it was a working solution to do Checkpoint Restore in Linux, but the problem was the Linux kernel community was not convinced of the approach. So the approach kind of died, and, and so people were looking at another way to do Checkpoint Restore in Linux. And next one is now Creu, Checkpoint Restore in user space, mainly because the one that before was in kernel, so now we're in user space. In user space means there's no specific code to do checkpoint restore in the Linux kernel. In user space also means that Creo was designed in such a way that it was using existing interfaces as much as possible. Over the last 10 years, Creo introduced in additional interfaces. None of the interfaces introduced in the Linux kernel are specific to checkpoint restore. They're usually kind of, how can I get more information about my running process? And um, so often they are often used for debugging and and similar things. So this is um, about Checkpoint Restore Creu. And now to the integrations. So there are multiple integrations of Creu in different container runtimes, engines, orchestrations. And the uh, first one I usually want to mention is OpenVZ. I never used OpenVZ myself, but they were basically doing containers before the word container existed. And what they we're doing, you would probably call today something like a system container, so not like an OCI container where you have just one application running in there, you had a whole operating system running in there. And they wanted to provide their customers, their users, a way to live migrate those 
system containers from one host to another. So they came up with Creo, and, and the good thing here about Creo to remember is that Creo was designed for containers. All the other checkpoint restore implementations which existed were for high performance computing, and they are still used in high performance computing today, some of them, but Creo was designed for containers, and that's why it works um, as good as it does today. So um, another interesting um, integration of Creo is Borg, that's con Google's container orchestrator engine. Also something I never saw myself, but um, Google came to us, the upstream Creo developers, maybe, I don't know, seven years ago, they talked at a couple of conferences how they use it internally. So before using Creo in, in their container engine, what they did is if there was a low priority task running on a node and resources were getting low, they just killed it and restarted it somewhere else, which meant they had to do, redo all the work. Today, from what we're told, they are using um, Creo to live migrate those uh, low priority containers from one node to another node without losing any of the work. Um, examples they, they like to give um, is video re-encoding in the background. So if they need additional resolutions of a video, then they do, do it um, in containers. And those are the containers which they um, actually migrate today um, in production all the time, uh, from what we're told. Then uh, there's Lexi, LexD Incus ecosystem. They also have support for Checkpoint Restore for a long time. Then Docker introduced it many years ago. Um, I've been working since 2018 on, on the Podman integration of, of Checkpoint Restore. And, and one of the reasons I started to look at Podman is because Cryo is similar to Podman from some of the code. So I could experiment with, um, with Podman getting a Checkpoint Restore working there. And then I brought it to, um, to Cryo today. And the reason to bring it to Cryo was to bring it to Kubernetes. And in Kubernetes, checkpoint, checkpointing currently is available under the label Forensic Container Checkpointing. We made it, um, it was, um, so this took us a couple of years to get it into Kubernetes. Um, it was um, moved to Alpha with 125 a couple of years ago, two years, I think, three maybe. And, um, and just a couple of weeks ago, we were able to, to move it to beta with 1.30. And this means um, from now on, checkpoint support is enabled by default. The, I say only checkpointing is uh, available because the forensic container checkpointing story is basically you have a container running, something unexpected happens. You don't want to stop it immediately but you want to take a copy. So forensic container checkpointing gives you the opportunity to take a stateful copy of your running container. The container will never know that it's checkpointed and later you can analyze the container in uh, somewhere else or you can start it again in a, in a sandbox environment. The restore part currently in, uh, in, in Kubernetes is kind of a, it's a bit uh, of a trick we, we trick Kubernetes into restoring a container. So we, we hook in cryo, in the create, and in the start call, we detect that it's a checkpoint. And if a checkpoint is, then we, we do a, a, a restore of the container. So from Kubernetes point of view, it's a starting of a container, but it actually is a restore of the container. So, and this is something I will show later in my, in my demo. And now a um, couple of use cases, just quickly going over why you, want, why you would want to use um, checkpoint restore in combination with Kubernetes or containers in general. So one, the first one is quick start, quick startup kind of. It's, um, you have a container, it takes a long time to run, uh, to start, you need to update your host because you need a new kernel. So you can take a checkpoint, reboot the host and the container will be restored much faster than it takes to initialize all the libraries. The multiple copies use case is similar to that. Um, this is also people um, talk to us which they use in production. So you have an application yeah, you want to offer to customers. It takes a long time to start, maybe 10 minutes because it lo loads thousands of libraries. 
And so what they do, they, they take a checkpoint after the initialization, and, and then they, whenever a customer requests the application, then they restore from the checkpoint, and the customer has to wait just a couple of seconds instead of 10 to 15 minutes. Then the container migration is, is one of the most obvious use cases from my point of view. You want the container, how you have it on one host, you want to move it to another host without losing the state. Then yesterday we had a talk um, about checkpoint restore and spot instances. Spot instances can go away anytime. So what you want to do, you do to, uh, if you get a signal that it goes away, you take a checkpoint and continue to run the container on some other host. All the examples um, at this point have been for stateful containers. If you have the stateless container, all this is not really helpful because you don't have a state you want to save. The forensic analysis use case is useful for all containers because even if it's state, stateless, maybe you want to analyze it without stopping the container. And something which uh, people talk to us a lot in the last year is AI training. So you have a container doing an AI model training with a GPU. You want to checkpoint it and run it somewhere else without losing all the work you've done so far. So let's go to my migration demo. So I have a, you can already see it here. I have a really simple um, pod specification. It's running two pods and I'm gonna, and this is about 500 kilometers meters away, the, this VM. So I'm gonna, um, it's not running. Let's start it. So this is of course a um, stateful application. It's a really simple application. It just has a state, nothing more. And I can talk to it um, just using curl. So now I have a counter. It says one, uh, zero, one, two. No, two. And now three. And now I can create a checkpoint. The checkpoint um, is currently available only as a kubelet only API. And this command does everything I need. But it's basically just calling curl on one of the kubelet APIs. And now the checkpoint is created. And I have the name of the file in the variable. There it is. And now I can. We, uh, we, we had a Google Summer of Code project using two, um, two great students who were helping us to write a tool to do the forensic analysis um, easily. And we have a tool called Checkpoint Control. And one example what Checkpoint Control can do, for example, is the inspect command. And what you see here is now you see basically it's the, the image it's based on, then the runtime dates when it was started, when it was checkpointed, the engine, the IP address, the size, and, and so on. And to migrate this container to another host, I have now to um, uh, convert this image to an OCI image. Let me do that on the top. I'm using Builder for that. So the first step should be to add the tar file to the new container image, then we do, no, then we uh, add some um, um, annotation to it so that it can easily be detect detected as a checkpoint. Then we do a commit, and then I delete the intermediate image. And now I have to push the image to a container registry. Let's push. Oh, there it is. And I'm gonna call it 51. And now on another VM, so this is now local on my machine here. I will, so previously I had a pod with two containers and now I'm migrating one of the containers into a pod with a single container. And again, really simple. I'm just replacing here the 50 with the 51. And now I will say apply. 
And now what will happen is that Cryo in the background will download the container image, see it's a checkpoint image, and then uh, do a restore. Kubernetes will believe it's a new container, but it's, it's an old container like we will see soon, hopefully. And now I will access the container, and now it should say, I don't know, what was the last? Oh, I don't see it anymore. So I think it should say four or five. I don't know, let's see, five, four. So the container has been migrated from one host to another host over a large distance, maybe. And so um, with this, I'm at the end of the introduction part about CRIU Checkpoint Restore. And please, Rosie. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, HPC applications are driven by scale and performance. And in order to process large amounts of data, they need to be distributed or to be running on multiple different servers. Um, the HPC community uh, has been uh, increasingly adopting Kubernetes, mainly because of the uh, features and benefits that it provides. However, um, the current checkpointing implementation um, is not able to checkpoint multiple containers at the same time. And the fundamental reason is because a crew was not designed to um, checkpoint distributed applications. It was designed to checkpoint a single process tree. So um, the question is, how can we extend CRIO to, to support distributed applications? And how can we um, enable this functionality in Kubernetes? And there, there is a, a large amount of research done um, on distributed checkpointing and the checkpointing and rollback recovery protocols. This was the, the, uh, the fundamental concepts were uh, created in the 1980s and 1990s when um, the resilience of computer systems uh, was fairly low. And uh, the most recent work, um, for example, that enables distributed checkpointing is DMTCP. Um, DMTCP is um, a tool similar to CRIU. It uh, provides a system level checkpoint restore. Um, the way it works, it works in user space, but the way it works is using the LD preload mechanism, which means um, if you, it's not fully transparent. So uh, to be able to checkpoint and restore application, you need to uh, be able to, you need to start this application with DMT speed launcher. Um, uh, DMT speed is also very, um, very similar to CRIU in a sense that it has been integrated, for example, with container platforms such as Aptainer. However, um, the way um, uh, the main point is that it provides a coordination mechanism that allows to essentially synchronize um, the checkpointing between different instances, and it's also doing this during during restore. Um, Another example is Apache Flink, which uh, provides very advanced fault tolerance mechanism to provide uninterrupted execution for um, data analytics and uh, data stream processing batch of jobs. Um, however, Apache Flink is, uh, is a framework. It, it, um, it, um, it, it, it cannot be used with existing uh, HPC applications. So, um, to be able to, um, to create a consistent global checkpoint, we first need to understand what, what does it mean to be a consistent checkpoint. And essentially, this diagram illustrates on the, uh, on the X axis the time of uh, different how different containers are running, and the red circles are checkpoints. And the checkpoint wave is essentially when uh, we create checkpoints for all containers. And when uh, a message has been sent, um, um, a checkpoint is consistent when uh, all arrows, arrows are messages being sent between different messages. And for a checkpoint to be consistent, it means that all arrows starting on, uh, should start on the left side and uh, finish on the right side uh, of the checkpoint wave. For example, messages uh, that are starting on the right side and finishing on the left are called orphan messages, or we have 
recorded in the checkpoint the receive event of the message, but not the send event. So this is the definition of inconsistent checkpoint. Um, so uh, most check, uh, distributed checkpointing implementations use a mechanism called barriers. And these are essentially points in the uh, checkpointing process when we have to synchronize um, the, uh, the checkpoint across different instances. Preview doesn't provide this type of barriers, but it has a functionality called action scripts, or essentially um, it has hooks or places during the checkpointing process or, and during the restore process where it can execute an external, uh, external utility and waits until this external utility completes. And in this case, to essentially enable synchronization, we, we developed a tool called Crew Coordinator, which essentially is used with this action script functionality to enable synchronization between different Crew instances. Um, so the Crew Coordinator tool has a client side and server side. It's using the client side to essentially register uh, different instances. With, with the server and um, essentially specify dependencies or which crew instance depends on uh, which others and then uh, use this to uh, essentially pause the checkpoint and uh, continue when all the dependencies have been satisfied. Um, the restore process works in a similar way. Um, um, essentially during restore we uh, we execute crew, crew starts the coordinator and then synchronizes and waits for all other dependencies to get to this point. And when the dependencies have been satisfied, it continues to, to the next uh, step. And uh, this essentially allows us to, um, to provide uh, distributed checkpointing without um, essentially needing to modify crew or modify Kubernetes or essentially uh, we can reuse the existing projects with, with this functionality. Um, uh, so this is a simple demo showing how it, the coordination mechanism can be used. So we first start um, to counter applications that are simply just outputting uh, a number every second. Then um, there is a configuration file for the coordinator tool defined in the uh, images directory where the checkpoint will be created. Um, and then we start the server on the right side and um, on the left side. And um, when the checkpoint is created, the application will well, Creo will start checkpointing, but it will stop until the, uh, the dependencies for the checkpoint are satisfied. And um, when the second uh, Creo instance starts, then it connects to the server, and um, this essentially triggers the synchronization mechanism to uh, continue the checkpoint. So essentially both checkpoints complete at the same time. And similar during restore, um, the restore process starts, at the, uh, the starts with the first application, then with the second, and um, essentially it makes sure that both um, the checkpointing and the restore process both happen at the same time. Um, so um, now that essentially we can um, synchronize the checkpoint when when we have application running on different nodes, we also want to um, transfer these checkpoints to a single location or a single server where um, we can essentially form a global checkpoint that can be used during restore. And for this, uh, we essentially have, a, a, we, we're using this streaming mechanism in Crew that allows us to transfer the uh, images from um, from all nodes during checkpoint and then collect them on the uh, destination site or where the uh, server is running. 
and uh, some future work is to essentially integrate these two with the uh, cry, uh, cryo and container D engines um, to essentially automate the dependency detection in Kubernetes or these are essentially identifying the um, which container depends on which other containers. Um, this is also very similar to the way you would, for example, start a pod. Kubernetes is using a list of dependencies to, uh, for example, start the in initialization container before application containers. Um, and uh, the future work is also to enable um, integration with a con Kubernetes objects such as uh, stateful sets and deployments. I think that's it, right? Yeah, that's it. We're at the end. Any questions? <laughs> there are two. I think you need to go to the mic, or our mic is coming to you. I don't know. There is one coming. Yeah. So I will answer the basic checkpoint resource questions about Creo and Kubernetes, and he will answer the... First of all, thanks for, thank you very much for the talk. So question one is, in your demo, when you did the checkpointing and restoring, if I understood right, Kubernetes took, knew that it's a restore by the notation of the image. Or Again, please? How the Kubernetes knew that this is a restore? Okay, Kubernetes doesn't know, it's just the container engine which does know it. So that was a notation. Th that's the annotation, because yeah, we... So, so what we do, we, we, we pass the image to, so basically Kubernetes passes the image during create to, to Cryo. Cryo downloads the image and then we check if it has an annotation. If it has an annotation, then we go an extra code path to do the restore. Yeah. So there is a simple if condition in the container in, in, in Cryo. Basically. Yeah, it's, it's really just if string exists, basically. Something. And the second one is like, in, I assume there is, do you know anything what's related being done in this space for the networking to resolve, let's say, give the same pod IP address, service put on the same like networking stack? Yeah, uh, good question. So for the, for the Podman migration work I, I did before, um, I, I actually, I, I, I'm restoring the IP address of the, of the container to be the same so that uh, TCP connections can stay alive. For Kubernetes, I never really looked into it because um, from my understanding, the network stack can be really complicated. But there's actually a Google Summer of Code project again um, this year um, in combination with P4. Yes, uh, so P4 is a uh, programming language for programming protocol independent packet processors. It's essentially a language used for programming um, switches such as Tofino, Intel Tofino, and um, uh, the P4 organization participates in Google Summer Code this year, and we have uh, actually a project that aims to solve this problem. Essentially, how do we migrate containers and enable changing the IP address? But the solution is essentially using load balancer. So you have all clients sending packets to the load balancer, and then the load balancer keeps track of essentially the updated IP address. Uh, but I basically ignored it so far because the whole networking thing is too complicated for me to understand. I'm, I'm focusing on a very small part right now. So, yeah, but, yeah, there was, yeah, please. Hi, this is Abhishek from IBM Research. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, so, I have a question related to AI workloads. Does oh, you have to speak up. I cannot hear you. Sorry. I have a question uh, related to AI workloads. Yeah. Does it also checkpoint um, this, the status of the GPU memory and, and other things? Okay, so the question is if, if, if we can checkpoint, basically if can we checkpoint containers using the GPU, right? Something like this. Okay, yeah, so, so it depends. Um, <laughs> so we can checkpoint uh, processes which are using AMD GPUs because AMD came to the Creo project and they provided a plugin to uh, support the GPU. 
So basically, whenever you have external hardware, which is not directly connected by the kernel, which you go around like InfiniBand, GPU, then there is an additional state in the GPU, in the InfiniBand card, which we cannot extract from, from Linux easily, so we need the, the plugin I mentioned. And for, from my point of view, this means that basically the vendor has to step up and write a plugin. AMD did it. There are videos around that there's also NVIDIA doing it. I think Microsoft had a video with ChatGPT where they claim they're using Creu and NVIDIA GPUs. There was a video from Memverge in combination with NVIDIA GPUs. So people are working on it, but people are not talking to the upstream Creu developers. So we are not aware of it, just that we see videos on YouTube on it. Yeah, so what is necessary to enable GPU checkpointing is essentially the ability to save the state of GPU and restore it back. Uh, AMD, um, the driver for AMD GPUs is open source, so they already implemented this. And you can um, checkpoint restore GPU applications with AMD GPUs. Uh, NVIDIA also have a team working on this, and they, there was a poster at uh, a conference a few days ago where they presented um, something that hasn't been released yet, but it's a proof of concept demonstrating that you can checkpoint restore GPU applications with Creo. There is also a startup called Sedano that are also focusing on essentially solving this problem and yeah there are multiple people working on essentially uh, this. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation that was great and interesting. Um, indeed you mentioned like a couple of use cases like uh, running some jobs basically, long running jobs but I could imagine uh, be uh, using that kind of uh, feature whenever there is a node that is reclaimed because actually Kubernetes nodes are reclaimed uh, regularly or are updated with versions. So it's like a very ephemeral uh, environment. Um, so I've, I believe that's very interesting uh, uh, solution for that kind of uh, use cases. But the demonstration that you made were, was really manual uh, is there any plan to automate all of this? Actually, make just asking, requesting the plan. Yeah, yeah. Manage so, that? so my my goal kind of is to have migration working, and in the best case, it's done by the scheduler. If there's a low priority container pod, it will be automatically moved anywhere else. But for the first part, which you saw now, this took at least four years, so, and it feels like this is 10% of the way, so yes, but it's, it's a long way. Hi, thanks for the uh, presentation. Okay. Question about the HPC um, part. How do you determine at what point, or in terms of time, how do you determine uh, whether all the pods or the containers is it a place where you can take a checkpoint? I think this is for you. Um, uh, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. sorry. You talked about Flink. For example, in Flink, they send a message to say, hey, that is the point all the processes need to take a checkpoint. Similar to that, do you have something in the case of HPC when you do a checkpoint? Yeah. Um, so essentially, the question is how do we uh, synchronize the checkpoint or how, for example, Flink is sending messages between uh, different um, essentially to initiate a checkpoint. And uh, with Creu, we can't really do that because uh, essentially Creu is not uh, something that is continuously running on the server. It's something that we need to start. So essentially when we want to create a checkpoint, we uh, start all Creu instances and can just go back. No, I, I can't, but um, essentially we have uh, action script hook called uh, pre-dump, which uh, essentially allows us to pause uh, Creo until all other instances are running. And this allows us to start the checkpoint at the same time. Uh, did that answer your question? Okay. Hi. Uh, first, congratulations on your work. One question. On the distributed setting, when you're doing to achieve a consistent cut, how are you capturing the messages in transit? So are you using sort of a Chandilan port algorithm or something like that? 
Yeah, um, I mean, we, we don't really capture the messages. In, in our case, we just freeze the whole process tree. So essentially, when all CRIO instances are um, synchronized at the pre-dump um, hook, then the next stage, uh, in the next stage, CRIO uses the freezer C group to essentially pause all processes. So in this case, um, all applications will, will be paused. And then when the checkpoint is complete, uh, again, it will synchronize the checkpoints and then it will resume them when uh, they're all synchronized. Yeah, I think, I think currently we don't have, uh, in, in this part there's no um, messages could get lost, definitely. If we talk about TCP, then TCP will do the retransmission, hopefully. If we talk about InfiniBand, then we're out of luck. If you're looking at, at what MPI does, basically, there used to be the MPI, oh, I know about OpenMPI, there used to be the framework to do checkpoint restore there. And what it did before was basically it, it quiesced all the processes in the MPI calculation to don't do any um, transmissions anymore. But if you're talking about InfiniBand, then your message will probably currently be lost. If we're talking about TCP, then we hope that retransmission saves us. And this is your research work, so it's not something that can be used in production yet. Maybe we will introduce the two-phase commit where we can capture this type of issues. Um, yeah, thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, I was thinking of the use case where we run basically a job like for an AI workload or something like that and maybe during the execution of the job which has a high value we don't want to lose it um, uh, something silly happens to the node I don't know disk is full or, or memory corruption and uh, maybe to kind of devise a way to restore the job on another node like in which case do you think uh, a node corruption uh, it would still be able to, we would still be able to uh, do the checkpoint and restore, and in which case it would not be possible. So, I, hard, hard question. So, um, I guess the, the thing is, uh, as long as you can read memory and, and registers, it might work, but if, if your uh, storage subsystem doesn't work anymore, then I don't know, then you maybe have to do it over network. So, it, it really depends on, on the things. And, and again, going back to HPC, there are lots of papers about um, fault tolerance using checkpoint restore, and there's a lot of research. What is the optimal checkpoint interval to, to regularly take checkpoints, but don't, you don't want to um, create too much I.O. for the I.O. subsystem so that it's only writing all the time and not doing any calculations. So this is heavily depends on your error, heavily depends on the application. So basically we cannot answer it, but uh, yeah, <laughs> depends. Yeah, thank you. There's one more question in the, in the second row. Um, in the Kubelet API path, so you had like for coordination some pre-dump action scripts. When we use the Kubelet API path, is there a way to tell Creo to take some actions pre-dump state because some of the applications require like you know some preparation, like deleting some files or just something to prepare the application mm -hmm. for a checkpoint? Yeah. So so basically, I guess your question is, how, can you can you um, tell Creo to do something differently. You, because Creo has many options and you want to select one of the options during um, your, your Kubernetes checkpointing cre creation. Yeah, who, something who, like who this. Up an action, so. Yeah. Yeah, so when I initially um, brought this up and, and we had to introduce the new CRI um, call, I had, I had a couple of parameters there, like TCP established and so on, but they were all um, removed during review because the, the, the story currently is the forensic container checkpointing and so it's, it's not needed. Um, I think it would be nice to have it in the future. The question is, do you want to expose it one-to-one to, -one to uh, so there is also a pull request currently from me open to do it on, on kubectl checkpoint. This also exists, it's not merged. So the question is, do we really want to expose all parameters from CRIU in kubectl and then pass them all the way through? There are also the, the configuration files, but the configuration files are not really useful if you're talking about a, a Kubernetes cluster because the configuration file has to be on the node CRIU is running. So I'm, I'm undecided, but I totally understand that we have to have a way to have additional parameters passed from basically from kubectl down to the 
Q, uh, to Crew, the lowest level, yeah. And actually there is, um, Oran C supports custom configuration file, so technically you can define a configuration file for every container uh, that your checkpoint fingers to work, and this allows you to essentially specify additional pre options that are being used for checkpoint. Okay, looks like we're done. Thanks a lot for your questions, for your time. I think you just turn it down.